Would you please join the choir in standing for the reading of today's gospel lesson? Our text is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Hear these words of Jesus. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went away. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed the other, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Then he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other ten tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruits. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the written word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> it is once again my honor to stand before you today, and I thank Kyle Reese for giving me this opportunity. It is not lost on me that this moment coincides exactly with the one-year anniversary of my ordination. I would be remiss if I did not take this chance to express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to you as a congregation for the love, support, grace, and encouragement that you have given me during this past year. It has been a true joy and at times a challenge to serve as your head of staff during this time of pastoral transition. And trust me when I say that no one is more glad than I that this period has come to an end. To draw on our stewardship theme, I believe that we have found a treasure in our new senior minister. And we are beyond blessed that he has accepted the call to serve among us. His knowledge and expertise is matched only by his warmth and kindness, and I know that I speak for all of us when I say that we look with great joy to the years ahead under his leadership. The last time I preached a sermon on a Sunday morning from this pulpit, the lectionary gospel text for the day was the account of Jesus casting demons into pigs and running them off a cliff. Today, the lectionary has given me wicked tenants. I'm trying not to read too much into this. Now, since I am a musician, you might think that I would choose instead to preach on the psalm text that is permeating the other parts of our worship service. However, always feeling that the gospel text deserves precedence, I've decided to accept the challenge given me and I will try to draw forth something of meaning from today's passage. I beg your indulgence as we seek to study this text together. Let us pray. God of all wisdom, give us your word and send us your spirit so that we may come to know Christ Jesus. Amen. My father loves to tell a story about when I was a toddler. It seems that we were in the living room watching television together. I was playing on the floor and he was sitting on the sofa. 
When the doorbell rang, my father sat down on the coffee table, a can of beer he was drinking, and left the room for only a few seconds. When he returned, he found me trying to down the entire can. I suppose that's the reason that I don't remember alcohol in our home when I was a child. I'm not sure if my parents were trying to set a good example or if they were worried that history might repeat itself. But nevertheless, I do not remember my parents drinking when I was little. However, by the time I was in high school, my parents started to be more open about alcohol and began modeling the habits of responsible drinking for me. Now, me being the goody two-shoes that I was, I did not have a drink until after my 21st birthday. But it was not uncommon for me to observe my parents having a glass of wine with dinner. One of my most vivid and funny teenage memories has to do with a Sunday evening dinner in our home at which my parents were both having a glass of wine. We had just gathered around the table, said the blessing, when we saw a flash of light bounce across the dining room ceiling. After living in that home for so many years, we knew that that phenomena was caused by a car driving up our driveway. I went to the bay window at the front of our house to observe my grandmother approaching the back door. In one fail swoop, my mother grabbed both of those wine glasses <laughs> and threw them into the microwave. <laughs> at the time, I didn't really understand and thought that her acrobatic routine was a little silly. However, I've now come to realize that my parents weren't so much hiding the wine because they were ashamed or worried that they would get into trouble, although I'm sure that had something to do with it, but rather out of respect for my grandmother and her beliefs. You see, my grandmother was what we might have called a teetotaler, and uh, she held very strong views about alcohol because of what she had seen it do to members of her family, people that she loved. Alcohol can be a rather taboo subject in today's society, and rightly so. It has caused so many people that we know and love to struggle with addiction. It has caused the untimely deaths of many people associated with drunk driving incidents. And here recently, it has even been used as a silly pawn in our political debates. But that was not the case in biblical times. In biblical times, alcohol, or wine, was one of the few liquids that you could consume safely. The fermentation killed bacteria and lessened the chance of contamination. When Jesus later turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, and then later used it as a symbol in his institution of the Last Supper, wine transformed from something that was merely safe into something that was divine. That brings us to today's parable, a story about a vineyard, a place where wine is made. There's an old Latin saying, in vino veritas, which means in wine there is truth. Now, I know that that can be interpreted in a, interpreted in a variety of ways, but still, I wonder if this parable might hold some truths for us as a congregation today. Today's gospel lesson is one of a set of parables that Jesus tells while he is in the temple in Jerusalem. He is talking not only to a crowd gathered there, but also to the religious leaders. They are listening in because they are worried by his teachings. And in their reactions to his stories, we see in this lesson the beginnings of their infamous plot to have him killed. This parable is only found in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And at first glance, I don't know about you, but I had a hard time trying to figure out what Jesus was really getting at. However, after he mentions the sacrifice of a son on behalf of a father, we, just like the religious leaders, 
come to know that he's talking about himself and his kingdom. The Bible often compares the people of Israel to a vine or a vineyard. And today, we see the vineyard in Jesus' story as representing the church and our work in the body of Christ. Jesus even said at another point in Scripture, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those that remain in me will bear much fruit. But it's very important for us to remember that what happens in the vineyard is not for the vineyard, but for the outside. The vineyard cannot adequately consume or enjoy all of the fruits of the vine. It must be shared and sold in order to bring joy and life to others. The same is true for the church. We cannot hold on to all of the wealth and nourishment that we receive within these walls. It is our duty to use what we have grown in this place to bring about God's kingdom out there. Now all of this talk of wine got me very curious about how wine is actually made. I have been to several vineyards over the years, but will admit that I often hurry through the tours to get to the tasting at the end. In doing some Googling, I discovered the production of wine is a very time-consuming process. From planting to fermentation, it takes about three years to make a bottle of wine. From the moment the seed is planted, it takes about a year for the vine to grow to maturity. I learned that the plant will not produce fruit during its first year and it will only produce fruit after it has been pruned. I seem to remember Jesus saying something about that as well. It takes three months for the grapes to ripen on the vine, six weeks to make the wine, three months for the sugar to turn into alcohol, and just over a year for it to ferment properly. In discovering this timeline, I could not help but think about the Lord's Vineyard that is located on this corner of Chippewa Square. When you think back over the three years since the pandemic, you begin to see that our congregation has been in its own sort of fermentation process. The year of the pandemic was a forced season of no growth. After that, our church went through a rather dramatic and painful pruning process. And now, a year later, we are finally starting to bear fruit. Attendance is growing. We once again have a complete staff. The long-awaited restrooms are finally done. <laughs> and we are financially stable. In the glow of these realizations, it would be very easy for us to rest on our laurels and to feel a well-deserved sense of pride and accomplishment. But we have to remember that there is more work to be done. For just as one harvest is gathered, it is time to start preparing for the next. And as I mentioned before, we have just hired a wonderful senior minister, and he's full of ideas and vision for the future of this church, but he cannot do it alone. He needs our help. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 9 that the harvest is often plentiful, but the laborers are few. And as we journey through this stewardship season together, I think it's a perfect time for us to examine our individual roles in the life and work of the church. Last week we had several Methodists join our congregation and I was reminded of the membership vow that Methodists take when they join a United Methodist congregation. When they are received into membership they vow to uphold the church with their, say it with me if you know it, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. I think this vow is very important 
and useful in all denominations because it shows forth all the ways that we can serve God and the church making use of the spiritual gifts that we have been given. In our congregation, we have people who give and serve in a variety of ways. Some are financial, and those are especially important during stewardship time. However, many serve through acts of service. Most of our members serve on a committee, but there are a few who go above and beyond what they are initially asked to do. Do you know that we have a church member who gets up almost at the crack of dawn on Sunday mornings to put out the parking signs on this street? Do you know that we have church members who have labored for more than a year to clean out and organize these buildings as they were under construction? Did you know that there are people who come in our office each week and file and organize and help with mailing? You see, no task given in the service of God is too small. Even the simple act of showing up in your place, in your pew, Sunday after Sunday, is a powerful witness to the people who may be visiting us. As we approach Stewardship Sunday, I want to ask you to pray sincerely about what God may be calling you to do to aid in the work of God in this good place. I am confident that our labors will produce fruit, and I believe that a bountiful harvest is in store for our congregation. There's an old gospel hymn that my grandmother loved that comes to mind as we talk about the work that is before us. It was penned by the blind hymn writer Fanny Crosby, who also gave us blessed assurance. I would like to share the words of the first stanza with you in closing. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master hath trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew, let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, let us hope and trust, let us watch and pray and labor till the master comes. May God grant us strength and determination as we go about this good work together. Amen. Thank you.